The stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of Those Burn Darkness. I'm your host, the man from Lang. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is part three of my preview of Edge of the Earth, the new expansions for the Arkham Horror LCG FFG dropped two of them on us on Thursday. The first, the Investigator expansion, includes the Investigators and the player cards, while the Edge of the Earth campaign expansion includes all of the scenario cards. We are going to take a look at the player cards in this episode. FFG spoiled, what, uh, almost a dozen cards of the uh, 250 or so player cards that will be included in the Investigator expansion. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Before we jump into the player cards, I'd like to thank the patrons of this channel for their tremendous support. The Arkham Horror LCG community is amazing, and these people have gone above and beyond to bring you content like these previews. If you'd like to support the channel's goals and see your name on this list, head over to patreon.com, sign up for a tier of your choice, and claim your rewards. That would be awesome. Without further ado, let's get started. FFG spoiled, uh, man, almost probably more than a dozen player cards. In their uh, preview article for the Investigator expansion for the Edge of the Earth product, and uh, we are going to run through them in this uh, part three of uh, my preview here. We uh, There are almost uh, uh, 40 plus investigators at this point, so apologies in advance if I uh, fail to mention a, a combo with one investigator or another. I will do my best, but I'm going to try to move through these fairly quickly because there are a lot of cards to uh, take a look at. And uh, of course, we don't know the entire contents of the expansion, so it's uh, difficult to see, uh, difficult to say right now whether there are combinations and investigators who would benefit from these cards uh, more than others. We are going to start with the card fan that was featured in the preview. Some uh, very tantalizing cards here. Uh, particularly that Seeker card up in the uh, top left corner, Force Learning. It looks like it is a permanent that you can purchase at the start of, uh, of a campaign. So looking forward to seeing what that one is. It appears to have uh, Norman Withers on it, so perhaps another tool for a Norman Withers deck. There's that uh, very uh, interesting looking Guardian card in the upper right, where a, uh, a man with an axe appears to be about ready to take down a Night Gaunt. Free event, fight action, that uh, says Nathaniel Cho to me. Of course, we've also got Lily Chen in this uh, particular campaign uh, expansion. But we have three cards we can take a look at in this, uh, in this card fan. The first is Meditative Trance, featuring none other than the Mystic Investigator in this expansion, Lily Chen. Two cost event with a willpower and intellect skill icon, insight and spirit traits. Game text is for each of your arcane slots that are, we cannot see, either heal one damage or one horror. Now the uh, spirit trade here synergizes, of course, with Calvin Wright. Calvin always likes uh, healing uh, damage and horror because uh, he tends to walk that fine line between uh, death and, uh, and life with that ability of his. And uh, of course the heal horror synergizes with Carolyn Fern. Now we cannot see what... Uh, whether the arcane slots need to be filled or empty. Now, I guess from a uh, thematic standpoint, I'd sort of expect the uh, the slots have to be empty uh, because, you know, sort of the whole empty mind thing. But uh, judging by the game text on Dragon Pole, another uh, mystic card that was spoiled in the preview article that I took a look at uh, briefly in the investigator preview, I think it's safe to assume that the healing will be based on uh, the number of arcane slots that are filled, not empty. So if you're playing, uh, say, a Lily Chen deck and you're able to keep those slots filled uh, so you can uh, uh, boost the uh, combat and damage of your Dragon Pole, you'll be able to play uh, Meditative Trance here and heal one damage or horror for each of those slots that are filled. Uh, of course, the Dragon Pole gives you an additional arcane slot, so you can have... Uh, uh, an easy way to get three arcane slots off the bat, and uh, FFG has, uh, the designers have been being uh, very generous with the arcane slots of late after being very tight-fisted in the early parts of the uh, of the uh, game's life cycle. Uh, arcane slots were very hard to come by, but uh, they seem to be a little more uh, available these days, and I expect there to be even more arcane slots available with the release of the uh, Return to the Circle Undone. Uh, campaign expansion here later this month. 
there is one uh, tarot card in there that lets you use your uh, uh, your accessory slots as arcane slots and vice versa. Now, I don't think those are accessory slots will count as ex uh, arcane slots for the purposes of this card, but uh, arcane slots are certainly becoming more available now. I don't know. Cards that heal damage and horror are uh, among the cards that I find to be uh, among the least interesting in this game. Um, soaking damage and horror takes a, a far greater priority for me than healing damage and horror. So it's it's tough to get excited about a card like this. It's nice to have a an event in the Mystic Card Pool that can heal damage and horror, so you don't. Um, have to take that action to play a card like Healing Word and then an action to trigger Healing Words uh, or Clarity of Mind, I believe, is the uh, the counterpart for uh, Horror. Uh, not a big fan of those cards, so I prefer an event like this that gives you the opportunity to heal multiple uh, damage and Horror uh, without having to take a bunch of actions to play either play assets to do it and then trigger those assets. So uh, I think this is better than those cards but uh, again not overly excited about cards that heal damage or horror there are, there's sort of a necessary evil sometimes depending on the scenario that you happen to be playing but uh, they're not a card i certainly want to build a deck around or i or i necessarily reach for so i think there are certainly investigators like carolyn and uh, possibly uh, lily who will get some use out of this maybe uh, calvin as well but uh, uh it remains to be seen whether this is going to, to, to see a, a ton of play going forward. The second card we have in the fan here is a survival, uh, survivor skill. This is Strength in Numbers. It uh, costs one experience point and it has one wild skill icon. It has the innate and synergy traits. I believe the synergy trait is new. I don't think we've seen that trait in uh, on previous cards. Innate, of course. Uh, plays with um, who is it Silas's deck building options he deals with innate traits but of course this is already a survival card so that doesn't really affect it the game text here is strength in numbers gains one wild skill icon for each different class among cards you control so this is a it's an interesting card I think for for most investigators uh, you know most investigators who have an off class they can control, say, one asset in their main class, one asset in their off class. So that would probably give them, you know, one or two uh, additional wild skill icons on this, uh, depending on your deck building restrictions. Um, somebody, uh, somebody like, uh, I mean, we have uh, Min Tae Fan being the seeker who loves skills. She could, uh, as long as she controls a couple of different uh, assets. Uh, a survivor asset and a seeker asset she could bump this up to three wild skill icons and uh, commit this to you know if, if her uh, i believe it's her signature uh, asset is on the table she could commit this to any um any test for any investigator at any location sort of thing of course there is uh lola hayes is the uh, only rainbow investigator that we have at the moment she can include uh, cards from all five uh, classes it's important to note here that uh, according to the uh, the basic rules at least uh, neutral cards are not a class so uh, you do not get a benefit from playing say a flashlight uh, as among the uh, the assets you control so potentially lola could bump this up to four or even five wild skill icons but i'm not too sure that plays well with with lola's uh well her ability gives her access to a lot of different classes her ability also uh, prevents her from uh, accessing all of those assets on the table so say if she has a mystic rogue and seeker asset she can only use one of those uh, until she switches uh, classes so not entirely sure whether uh, it's really worth the effort for lola uh yeah it's i mean it's another skill with a bunch of wild skill icons on it it's hard to really get all that excited about strength and numbers we've seen uh over the past couple uh, cycles, we've seen a lot of skill cards that come with a pile of wild skill icons on them. Uh, Promise of Power from the Innsmouth the Conspiracy, uh, Chief among them. Uh, so these types of cards, while powerful, because uh, obviously wild skill icons are, 
are extremely versatile and powerful. The cards themselves aren't overly interesting. I don't think it's a card that you're going to be building your deck around. Uh, if you have an experience point and you want wild skill icons, perhaps like an investigator like Min Tae Fan, um, and you have you control assets from a from a variety of uh, of uh, classes. Uh, perhaps even you could go say versatile min and uh, uh, include an asset from an uh, another uh, color so you could boost this up to even four wild skill icons plus the one she adds which would be five that's starting to look pretty powerful five wild skill icons is nothing to uh, to sneeze at and uh, combined with min's ability to contribute those skill icons to pretty much anybody on the table uh, that is pretty nice. But yeah, again, it's it's a pile of wild skill icons. Uh, if if that's the sort of uh, card you're looking for, then uh, you can't really go wrong with one experience point. But uh, again, you know, is in terms of, of interesting deck building to do, uh, not uh, not a whole lot there um, to uh, to get too excited about. We can also see in the corner there Moxie Three. Now this one caught me uh, caught me by surprise. Uh, we can't really see much of the game text. Uh, it's a free uh, asset that costs three experience points. The game text seems to be quite similar to uh, Moxie's level one counterpart that was released in the Echoes of the Past expansion uh, moxie one of course costing one uh, one resource it appears now moxie one does not let you soak any damage it has a doesn't soak any damage only soaks one whore it appears that uh, moxie three will allow you to soak some uh, damage as well as the one horror so that's a that's a big change between the two of them now Unfortunately, the composures that were released in Echoes of the Past have not uh, seen a whole lot of play um, since their release. I've played around with Moxie a little bit in a Winifred Havamock deck as a way of uh, trying to mitigate her low willpower. I've played it in combination with uh, Elder Sign Amulet. Uh, obviously here the elder sign amulet providing you with a, a good way of soaking plenty of horror so you don't have to to soak that horror using the moxie and then uh, causing you to discard the moxie before you really get any value out of it um it's not a very elegant solution to the rogue's willpower problem but um it did manage to get me through the secret name so uh i can't really complain uh, it did uh, it did the work. Uh, unfortunately, it does appear as though Moxie three has that non-direct horror must be assigned to Moxie before it can be assigned to your investigator card clause, which means that uh, it's going to be tricky to use. It only soaks one horror, only one sanity there. So if you get pinged for a horror and you're not ready to soak it with an ally or a card like the Elder Sign Amulet. Your moxie disappears and uh, it's gone, and uh, that kind of sucks. So, while I've experimented with moxie level one, I don't think you know. Based on what I see here, I'm not overly excited about spending two additional experience points for moxie level uh, three. I mean, a little extra damage soak is nice, but as long as it has that clause that I take one horror and I don't have the soak for it, it gets dumped on this and I lose the card. Not uh, not a particularly big fan of that. So uh, yeah, I'm unless there's some game text hidden behind strength and numbers there that I'm not seeing, uh, I'm not particularly excited about uh, uh, Moxie 3 and, I, and making it free, hey, that's great, saves you a resource, but uh, if it's not going to spend much time on the table, then uh, it's not going to not going to see much play. Now, maybe if they bumped the sanity up by one, so it had two sanity instead of one, that might be worth considering. But uh, from what I see here, I'm not uh, particularly uh, confident in this card uh, gaining a whole lot of traction once this expansion is released. 
Let's move on to, we're just going to go through the cards. Uh, there's a lot of uh, gold multicolor cards in this particular expansion. We're going to deal, we'll go Guardian Seeker, uh, no rogue cards were previewed, Mystic, and uh, then we'll take a look at the, uh, the gold cards. The uh, Guardian card we're looking at here is Sweeping Kick, level one. It is a uh, one cost event with uh, combat and agility skill icons. Spirit, Tactic, and Trick Traits. Fight, add your uh, agility skill to your skill value for this attack. This attack deals plus one damage. If you succeed, automatically evade the attacked enemy. Now, uh, this is uh, a fight action. So, uh, of course, the and an event for that matter. So it will uh, synergize with Nathaniel Cho. Has the tactic trait, so uh, it synergizes with... Uh, with the uh, the guardian permanent whose name uh, escapes me for the moment the trick trait actually synergizes with uh with Reedy young and i can't recall i don't think she has access to many guardian cards but uh certainly having ac access to another fight action that adds her massive five agility to her combat value is uh, is pretty nice for plus one damage uh, and the spirit trait, of course, is nice because it synergizes not only with Calvin, but more importantly, uh, the boxing gloves, which are the uh, primary asset in uh, in the Nathaniel Cho starter deck. So if you happen to uh, uh, defeat an enemy with the boxing gloves, uh, you can certainly find a, a copy of Sweeping Kick in your uh, draw deck. Search your draw deck, find Sweeping Kick, and keep the uh, the combat train rolling. Now. The, uh, the auto evade here is uh, actually, qu I quite like that for a, uh, for a guardian. Uh, the, it's important to note here that the auto evade is, uh, works against elite or non-elite enemies. So if you're facing a particularly dangerous enemy that dishes out a lot of uh, damage, and in the guardian's case, horror is often a big concern because they, lack, uh, they are lacking in the sanity department, being able to uh, attack this thing, hit it for a bunch of damage, and then auto evade it so it does not have a chance to attack you back in case you don't kill it is uh, very, very nice, especially for a guardian who, uh, for guardians who tend to have uh, average to below average uh, agility scores. So evading enemies um, using agility is often a non-starter for them. So this uh, combines a fight action with an evade action and uh, I mean, what can you say? That's that's excellent, excellent action economy. It can protect a guardian from uh, from being attacked during the enemy phase if you happen not to kill it. If you're happening to fight a boss with a ton of health, this uh, gives you the evade, so it uh, will uh, prevent it from attacking you, and then you can resume your uh, attacks with it next turn. Of course, uh, Lily Chen is portrayed on the card, and Lily is uh, bare minimum. Uh, you know, if she's got balance of body out, she's hitting for eight with this thing. Eight for plus one damage and an auto evade. That's excellent. So really uh, like the looks of Sweeping Kick here. Lots of different, uh, I think it's a, a pretty nice option, not just for Lily, but uh, obviously Nathaniel Cho can get quite a bit out of this. Um, it's got the tactic trait, so if you do happen to purchase Stick to the Plan, you can stick this on there and uh, have an attack at your fingertips. And uh, and I do like the option of having that auto evade, especially for guardians who, while guardians are you know primarily uh, focused on killing enemies, it really doesn't hurt to have that evade in your back pocket, uh, especially if you start to run low on uh, sanity like some of the guardians uh, can do. So. Really uh, like the look of Sweeping Kick here and uh, hope to see, uh, I mean, I'm curious about that uh, Guardian event that we saw in the card fan. Uh, could that be another card for Nathaniel Cho? We will have to wait and see to, uh, to find out. The other uh, Guardian card that was uh, spoiled in the preview is Butterfly Swords. It's a three cost uh, asset that costs two experience points, combat and agility skill icons, item, weapon, and melee traits. As an action, you can fight. You get plus one combat for this attack. After this attack, you may exhaust Butterfly Swords to fight again, adding your agility skill value to, uh, to your skill value for that attack. That attack deals plus one damage, and it takes up uh, 
takes up both hand slots. Now, I talked a little bit about this card uh, in the investigator preview as it pertains to Lily Cho, uh, sorry, Lily Chan, and uh, and uh, its comparison to um, to Dragon Pole, the other weapon that was mentioned in the preview article. Honestly, I don't think dedicated guardians are going to be all that interested in butterfly swords. Um, the action advantage it generates is is pretty nice and uh so you get the the one fight action and then you get a second fight action with uh, adding your agility which you know not particularly good in most guardians but you know adding two or three to your skill value is always uh, is always going to be nice and the extra damage is nice but i think a lot of guardians like a dedicated guardian that is responsible for killing the big monsters on the table Two experience points is really an awkward spot on the on the experience point scale. I don't see a lot of guardians purchasing this at this level rather than just skipping and going up and buying, spending a lot of experience points on cards like flamethrower or lightning gun or shotgun or any number of you know the holy spear that was released in into the maelstrom. Any of those big weapons, I think, are going to be a top priority for for the guardian in the party that is uh, primarily concerned with killing enemies. So I think this is probably uh, going to be a, a Lily Chan card. Um, again, I think it's a bit too early to to know which is going to be the best weapon, whether it's the dragon pole or the butterfly swords. Uh, butterfly swords in combination with balance of body, uh, you can attack twice, uh, using these for two damage then you could trigger balance of body attack again for a third damage uh, you get an extra attack with butterfly swords so that would add another two damage so to about five damage uh, you know barring vicious blows and whatnot and then you know you pair this up with two other different fight actions maybe uh, a one-two punch and a sweeping kick and you're up to you know eight or nine damage by the end of it which is pretty good which is comparable to dragon pole uh as long as you know if, if you don't have the uh, uh arcane slots filled for dragon pole i think this one's a this one's a pretty good choice so yeah i think it's a bit early to say you know which is going to be the west the best weapon for her we don't know what the combat uh, uh discipline does now it occurred to me that uh the um, balance of body, the agility uh, discipline for her, uh, looks like it's going to be a lot of, you're going to be making a lot of strikes, especially if you get lucky and pull some Elder Signs and are able to ready balance of body uh, or flip it back to its unbroken side. Theoretically, you could just get nine attacks in a turn based on balance of body alone. So, but you're going to be making a lot of attacks, but you're not going to be hitting particularly hard with those attacks. So uh, perhaps the combat discipline is, is sort of the opposite. You're making fewer attacks, but you're going to be hitting. Maybe she gets a damage bonus or something like that if she's using the combat discipline. So she's hitting less, but she's hitting harder. And so I think that could be, uh, maybe that's where that goes. Now, of course, Butterfly Swords does require um, you to fill up both your hand slots, which is never ideal in solo. Not a big deal in multiplayer, if you're, especially if you're the dedicated monster killer. Uh, but in solo, um, Lily's intellect is only two, so she's not particularly good at investigating. So she's going to either need to uh, resort to her arcane slots for cards like Sixth Sense and Rite of Seeking and whatnot, or um, just rely on the old trusty flashlight from the core set. Uh, she does have the option, of course, of uh, buying Bandolier, which can help mitigate that somewhat. But, you know, when I looked at, at the cards that are available in the Mystic card pool and the Guardian card pool that take up hand slots, there's not a lot there that, that Lily really wants. So taking up both hand slots isn't, uh, I don't think that's going to be a huge deal for her. It's not, I don't think it's a deal breaker in any way. So again, I, you know, when I just sort of run the numbers on Butterfly Swords, it's pretty good damage in the end. Uh, I think Dragon Pole is slightly better and provides slightly larger attack bonuses, but uh, it requires you to fill arcane slots. And uh, 
given Lily's deck building restrictions, I'm not entirely sure that that is going to be, uh, that may not be an option. So we shall see. But uh, in terms of, of uh, just action advantage, uh, Butterfly Swords is uh, pretty good. But uh, yeah, I don't think many dedicated guardians are going to be spending two to four experience points on a weapon that honestly doesn't provide a very large combat bonus and does not dish out a lot of damage. I think they'll they're going to skip over this and go right to the flame floor, flame thrower, the holy spear, and 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 whatnot. We have a seeker card written in the stars. It is a one cost event that cause that has a wild skill icon. It has the insight trait. It is fast, and you may play only during your turn. Discard the top card of your deck. If that card is a weakness, shuffle it back into your deck. Otherwise, for the remainder of your turn, while that card is in your discard pile, commit it to each eligible skill test you perform. So first thing we notice is that uh, this is uh, has the insight trait, so it does synergize somewhat with uh, Joe Diamond's hunch deck. Not sure if it's the... If it's a great option for Joe, but uh, if he does want to play, put this in his hunch deck and play it for free, that is an option. Now, this uh, this card really synergizes nicely with uh, the investigator in the box, Norman Withers, who can also play this for free if it's on the top of his deck. Uh, and he already knows what the top card of his deck is, so he can... Uh, so uh, he gets uh, a lot more versatility out of this. It also works well with uh, in the investigator Gloria Goldberg, who was released in the uh, Dark Revelations. Uh, her promo card was released in the Dark Revelations novella. Uh, synergizes nicely with Alyssa Graham, the uh, mystic ally from uh, Undimensioned and Unseen. Scroll of Secrets, from uh, which was released in the Secret Name, and the upgrades came out in uh, For the Greater Good, especially since they swapped the uh, action on Scroll of Secrets to a free triggered ability. That makes that card a lot better. And of course, we have Scrying from the core set. Scrying's a bit slow, I've found, and, and I haven't played it in a while. But uh, if you want to control the uh, the cards that are on top of your draw deck, uh, it's the way to go. Now, the power here is actually pretty good, I think. For, for a one-cost event, if you can, uh, you know, if you can commit the... So you, you discard the top card of your draw deck... There are plenty of, of skills around these days that have tons of wild skill icons on them. If you can happen to discard one of those cards, you know, committing a card with a pile of wild skill icons on it to three plus skill tests during your turn is pretty, pretty good. I would certainly be quite happy to, say, commit um, Inquiring mind. say I'm just picking a skill or, or say even Promise of Power four wild skill icons to three tests and generating three uh, three curse tokens is you're going to pass a lot of tests if you're committing four four wild skill icons to each of them so that is uh that's pretty good so i think for for uh for investigators like norman gloria uh, and if you're using cards like Alyssa, scroll of secrets or scrying this this is a pretty attractive option I think that obviously the card is much less impressive if you are blindly discarding cards from um, from the top of your deck and hoping for the best. I just don't think you're going to get a whole lot of value out of that. Occasionally you'll get lucky and discard something with a pile of icons on it, but for the most part I think this is this card is going to work best with a little bit of setup. So you're really going to need to be playing somebody like uh, Norman or Gloria who can really uh, has that has those deck manipulation options at their fingertips and uh, can get the most value out of this card this otherwise yeah i don't think you're going to be uh, all that interested in uh, in playing this it's just a little bit too random um for uh, for what it can do um you know discard the again you're going to be discarding a card it might be a card you really need uh, or it just might be a card that has one or two skill icons on it that don't really match with what the skill tests you're going to take this turn. So yeah, not uh, not impressed if you're not playing one of those investigators, but uh, I think, man, combine this with Inquiring Mind or, or Promise of Power or any of those, like even Min, uh, if she can uh, team this up with Strength and Numbers that we looked at earlier, it's a lot of wild skill icons and those are going to help you pass tests, especially uh, I found 
playing on uh, hard difficulty lately, those a pile of wild skill icons can really, really help out. So if you're uh, if you're able to guarantee, say, three plus wild skill icons on three tests during a turn, that goes a long way to mitigating some of the that variance in the uh, in the chaos bag. So uh, a good option if you uh, if you are playing that manipulation game. If you're not, then you're probably not going to be uh, playing written in the stars. That brings us to uh, the dragon pole, which I have uh, talked about uh, both in the investigator starter uh, investigator preview as well as a little bit earlier talking about butterfly knives. Uh, this is a three cost asset with uh, a combat skill icon, item weapon, melee traits. You have one additional arcane slot. You may fight, you get plus one combat for this attack for each of your arcane slots that is filled. If you, if at least two of your arcane slots are filled, this attack deals plus one damage and it takes up a um, uh, both hand slots. Now, I think, you know, based on the math that was keeping me up at night uh, last night after this uh, pr massive preview dropped, Dragon Pole is a pretty good option uh, for Lily. Uh, because uh, the combat bonuses are pretty good if you have those slots filled. So theoretically, you know, you're getting that one additional arcane slot. So there's three arcane slots. If you can fill all three with, uh, with a fight, investigate, and evade uh, asset, you're getting uh, plus three combat with this thing. That's, that's really good. And if at least two of those slots are filled, you're getting that plus one damage, which is uh, all important. If you combine this with a, with a card like Balance of Body, her one of her disciplines, you could take your first action to fight with Dragon Pole. Uh, you'd be getting, say you just have two slots filled. She's got four combat. You'd be up to six combat, which is pretty good against most enemies. So you're, you're uh, making a six skill test for two damage. You could swing again, another six skill test for two damage. Swing a third time after you trigger balance of body. Um, you're swinging for six for two damage. And then you could use one two punch to get another two attacks, one for one damage, one for two, and finish off with a sweeping kick for another two damage. And the auto evade, that's, that's 11 damage right there. And uh, we haven't even talked about, you know, Lily uh, getting lucky pulling an elder sign and uh, readying balance of body uh, and then uh, getting three more attacks you know it's just uh, as long as you can generate enough different attacks you can generate a pile of additional uh, combat actions fight actions with this and and so i think dragon pole is a pretty pretty good option for uh, for lily as long as she can fill those arcane slots that's the thing i'm not entirely sure about um if Lily's deck building uh, restrictions are similar to that of Norman, and the preview article seems to suggest they are, she may only have access to five level zero. Uh, she may only have access to uh, a bunch of level zero mystic cards and then five guardian cards, if I've got that right. So uh, she's going to be moving away from her mystic cards. So. Yeah, I yeah, it's probably not a not an issue. It's more it's more going to be uh, uh, getting enough of those those guardian cards. Um, she's only going to have access to five level zero guardian, maybe five level zero guardian cards, and then she'll have to be spending her experience to bump those up. So, as long as Lily can keep her mystic slots filled, uh, this is a pretty good option. Again, two handed weapon, not great in solo especially given Lily's two, uh, two intellect. But uh, if she doesn't need to wield a flashlight, uh, arcane slots can be filled with uh, cards that can boost her investigate. So she can rely on her, on her willpower to do that instead. So quite like the look of Dragon Pole, looking forward to, uh, to giving it a try in, uh, in Lily. And uh, who knows, we don't know what her combat discipline does. And so maybe that synergizes better with, uh, with the dragon pole. That brings us to the astronomical atlas. It is a three cost asset that costs three experience points, willpower and two intellect skill icons, item and tome trait. It has two free triggered abilities. The first exhaust astronomical atlas 
Look at the top card of your deck. If it is not a weakness, attach it face down to Astronomical Atlas. Max five cards attached. And the second free triggered ability is commit a card attached to Astronomical Atlas to an eligible uh, skill test. If that skill test succeeds, add that card to your hand instead of discarding it. Limit once per test and it takes up a hand slot. So again, this card is uh, similar to written in the stars in that it uh, the first free triggered ability synergizes very nicely with cards such as Norman Withers, Gloria Goldberg, Alyssa Graham, uh, the Scroll of Secrets, and Scrying. If you're able to manipulate what the top card of your deck is, or you happen to be Norman and know exactly what the top card of your deck is, uh, you can exhaust the Atlas and move it over to it. So if you happen to, to know there's an Inquiring Mind sitting on the top of your deck, awesome. You can uh, exhaust the Atlas, put the Inquiring Mind on the Atlas, and uh, use it for a future skill test. Now, uh, this is a particularly nice pickup for Norman uh, because it synergizes uh, nicely with what I, when I was talking about in his uh, the Investigator preview. Norman decks tend to avoid playing skills because they, they lock him out of his special ability. At least they did. Now that he's got his new sign signature card, Livre de Bon, he can uh, get those skills off the top of his, uh, off of his deck and uh, either uh, bring them up to his hand to swap a card or uh, commit them to a skill test. Now, Astronomical Atlas lets him do something similar, so you can include more skills in your Norman Withers deck. If a skill ends up on top of your deck, you can use the Astronomical Atlas to uh, move it to the Astronomical Atlas and then clear that slot up, so uh, revealing a card uh, below that you may uh, be able to play for, uh, uh, for cheap for that minus one resource cost. Now, the, uh, the other really nice thing here about the Atlas is that, uh, I mean, you commit that card to a skill test, and if that skill test succeeds, you get to bring it back to your hand. So you stack a uh, uh, you know, promise of power on this thing. You get four wild skill icons on one test plus a curse token. That test is probably going to succeed if you're committing four wild skill icons. You pop that back to your hand. And then you're getting another four wild skill icons on another test and another curse token if that happens to be if you're playing uh, that curse deck every curse token adds up so the ability to commit a skill to two different tests is very very good um, not going to complain about that especially if you can get some of those high um, those skills with a pile of wild skill icons on them you're going to get a lot of uh, utility out of this now again uh, much like uh, written in the stars if you're not playing an either Norman who knows the top card of his deck or Gloria who has a, a lot of ways of manipulating what card is on top of her deck, it's going to be a lot less impressive if you're just blindly drawing cards off the top of your deck and stacking them on this. Not, I'm not sure I'd be willing to pay three experience points and three resources for that sort of variability. It's just a little bit too random for my, for my liking, but I think... Uh, Certainly Norman or, uh, or Gloria could get a lot of value out of the Astronomical Atlas. Uh, or if you're just playing an investigator who can <clears throat> find a way to manipulate the top card of their deck, uh, that would be a, a good way of, uh, of leveraging some of those skill cards. I'm trying to think offhand if there's a... I'm not sure if there's a Mystic Investigator who can really uh, place the skill game. So, you know, maybe if we do see a... Uh, a mystic investigator down the road who really likes skills uh, similar to Min or uh, Silas, uh, a card like this is going to be, man, this is this is right up their alley. So again, much like Written of the Stars, uh, good in certain decks. I think they'll, they'll really appreciate this tome. Uh, if you're not playing those sort of manipulation decks, you're not really going to see uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, use out of this. That brings us to the first uh, gold multi-class card of the preview. This is Medical Student, a two-cost asset with a, with a uh, willpower skill icon ally, miskatonic, and science trait. It has a response after Medical Student enters play, heal one damage and one horror from an investigator or ally asset at your location. It has one health and one sanity, and it takes up the ally slot. 
So we've already seen one uh, one Miskatonic student, the art student, uh, way back in the Dunwich Legacy uh, uh, releases. Uh, we had art student, which of course lets you discover a clue uh, when it hits the table. Not sure medical student is as good as the art student. Again, um, the ability to heal damage and horror um, while being a necessary evil, it doesn't really get me all that excited because it really doesn't do anything unless you've taken damage and horror. And for the most part, uh, barring a few scenarios that really pile it on, I, I find that I'm generally able to, to manage the amount of uh, damage and horror I've taken just through soak on, uh, on allies and other assets. But of course, uh, the ability to heal one damage and one horror uh, simply for playing an ally is, is quite good. Uh, the ability to heal ally assets is going to be key during the Edge of the Earth campaign, considering all of those expedition members are allies, and uh, once they're gone, you're gone. So having a medical student along to keep them uh, uh, sane and healthy uh, could be very important indeed. Uh, of course, the heals horror uh, element synergizes with uh, Carolyn Fern. While that Miskatonic trait synergizes with Miskatonic archaeology funding, I've tried to play around a little bit with, with archaeology Miskatonic uh, or Miskatonic archaeology funding. I haven't really seen uh, a lot to get excited about there yet. Um, this doesn't really add much to that excitement, unfortunately, because it is uh, healing damage and horror. But uh, Again, if you if you want to heal damage and horror, this is a, a nice option, and it provides you with uh, with another health and uh, sanity. Uh, doesn't soak as much as the art student does. Doesn't discover you a clue like the art student does. But uh, I tend to find cards that heal damage and or horror a little bit dull. And uh, but uh, given the type of campaign where we're that we're going to be heading into that will feature a lot of allies and uh, probably a lot of damage and horror. Uh, you probably can't go wrong by bringing a medical student along. Of course, medical student is a guardian and seeker card. Uh, so uh, 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 guardians and seekers uh, alike can, uh, can benefit from the medical student. Uh, perhaps guardians would like to have that uh, little bit of extra horror. So well, Seekers, of course, would like that damage, and of course, uh, allies always uh, need to be healed. So, not terribly excited about this card, but uh, I can see uh, certainly see its value, uh, especially heading into the uh, upcoming campaign. That brings us to Blur. Wow, this card is cool. Blur level one. So this is the, the first of several gold multi-class cards that cost XP. We haven't had cards that uh, gold cards that cost XP in the past. Uh, as you may remember back in the secret name, they released uh, all the gold cards. And then when they upgraded them in For the Greater Good, they uh, produced or created uh, class versions for each of them. So uh, for example, the Grizzly Totem, you ended up with a seeker version and a uh, survivor version. Uh, Scroll of Secrets, you ended up with a Seeker version and a Mystic version, and so on and so forth. Blur costs, is a two-cost asset that costs one experience point. It is a Rogue and Mystic card. It has one agility skill icon. The spell trait uses three charges. As an action, if Blur has charges remaining, evade. For this evasion attempt, you may use Willpower instead of Agility, and you get plus one skill value. If you succeed, spend one charge, and you may take an additional action this turn. If you succeed by zero, take one damage, and it takes up an arcane slot. Wow, this... There are so many investigators who can benefit uh, from this card. Now, first of all, it seems like this is a part of a new triad of investigate, fight, and evade spells. We are going to look at another one in that triad here in a moment. Uh, the investigation one, we haven't seen the fight one yet, but I assume it, it exists. So another triad. Spell trait, of course, synergizes with uh, many, many mystic cards at this point in the game's life cycle, including Uncage the Soul, if you want to play this for free, or uh, Marie, La Marie Lambeau, who can uh, triggers off that spell ability to, uh, to gain additional actions. 
Now, the nice thing here is that uh, as long as you have charges remaining on this thing, you don't have to spend a charge to trigger the evade. So as long as you keep one charge on this, you can continue to, uh, to use this to evade, which is pretty nice. Now, it's an interesting option for, for both high willpower investigators and high agility investigators, I think. Um, high agility rogues like uh, Winifred, for example, or uh, Monterey, who is the rogue investigator in this particular expansion, uh, both of them are going to have five agility, six with the plus one skill value, which is, uh, which is pretty good with evasion, uh, considering that many monsters do not have very high evade values. So you don't really need uh, as high an evade value as you say may need a fight value if you're fighting. So while most rogues have miserable willpower, uh, they can, they do have the option of using their agility instead if they prefer. Now, the really sweet thing about this card is that if you do succeed on the evasion attempt, then you can spend a charge and you get an additional action. That is, uh, that is fantastic. Uh, it's uh, unlike some of the cards that we have seen uh, in these triads. I'm thinking of Miss Cerulea, which lets it, it sort of gives you an additional action, but it's very restrictive on what it lets you do. It just lets you move to a, uh, to a neighboring location. This just gives you an action which you can use to do anything, which is uh, is way better. Um, man, just you know, gaining that additional action to do whatever you want. Uh, of course, if you succeed by zero, uh, you're going to take a damage. That's probably not going to happen all that often. It's pretty. That's a pretty narrow window. You have to be pretty precise to hit the, just to succeed by zero. So if you fail, you don't take any damage. If you succeed by one or more, you don't take any damage. So I think the odds of you taking damage with this card is, is going to be very small. And man, there are some, some pretty nice combinations here. Uh, take Akachi, for example. Akachi uh, adds an additional charge to Blur, so she can get generate four additional actions with this thing over the course of a scenario at least. That is pretty good. Um, Dexter can bounce this with his Elder Sign ability, so uh, he plays Blur, he uses, uh, he evades, he uses up those additional actions, and then he draws an Elder Sign, bounces this back to his hand, and then plays it again, and he gets more additional actions. That's pretty sweet. Uh, Marie benefits already from the spell trait. The spell trait gives her sort of an additional action, and then she can generate more additional actions by using Blur. So. Uh, Marie, you can get her up to five uh, actions in a turn with this sort of thing. And of course, we haven't uh, discussed uh, recharge yet, which, which would allow you to add more charges to this thing uh, if necessary as well. Uh, the, the one level of recharge not being so good, the, the higher level uh, version being much better. But man, I really like this card. I mean... For uh, for a rogue or a mystic, uh, the ability to take that additional action is very, very strong. And uh, I think this one is going to see a lot of play, uh, play going into uh, the future. That brings us to Divination 1. It is the investigate uh, piece of the triad. It is a three cost asset that costs one experience point. It is a seeker and mystic card. Uh, comes with an intellect skill icon, the spell and augury trait, uses four charges. As an action, you can investigate. For this investigation, you may use your willpower instead of your intellect, and you get plus one skill value. If you succeed, spend one or two charges. Instead of discovering a clue at your location, discover one clue at your location for each charge spent. If you succeed by zero, choose and discard a card from your hand. This takes up an ally, uh, an arcane slot. Again, much like the, uh, uh, this is part of the new, uh, I guess, multi-class triad of uh, fight, investigate, and uh, evade assets. Uh, again, it has the spell trait, so it's going to synergize with uh, a ton of mystic cards, uh, including Uncage the Soul and, and Marie Lambeau and many, many others that uh, Robes of Endless Night. Man, the, the list just goes on and on at this point. So if you have an investigator who prefers using their willpower, uh, you're going to still get that plus one skill value, or if you uh, have a very power strong intellect, you're going to get that plus one skill value. And if you succeed, then you have the option of spending one or two charges in order to uh, 
gather one or to discover one or more clues at that location, which gives you a, a nice option, uh, especially if you're playing in solo and you are you have those uh, like most locations have one clue on them but occasionally you do run into those uh, those locations that have two clues per investigator so having this in your back pocket to be able to just say okay i'm gonna um, i can use this to, to discover one clue at some locations and then i'll i'll use two charges to get pick up two at another it's very nice again if you succeed by zero, you have to choose and discard a card from your hand. I don't think that's going to happen all that often. Again, nothing happens if you fail. And, you know, if you're if you're a high willpower or intellect investigator who's already getting plus one skill value, it's going to be awfully tough to succeed by zero. More than likely, you're going to be uh, you're going to succeed by one or more. So I wouldn't. Uh, the downside on this is really uh, minimal. Again, uh, since it uses charges, Akachi gets an extra charge. Dexter can bounce this after he's used all the charges and then play it again with his, uh, uh, bounce it with his Elder Sign and then play it again uh, with uh, his ability so he can, uh, he can uh, refresh all of the charges on this and discover more clues. And uh, Marie benefits, of course, from that spell, uh, that spell trait again. If you're looking for more charges there's plenty of cards in the card pool i believe uh i mean recharge is the obvious one but there there are others so uh, it doesn't give you an additional action like the evade version does uh but uh i mean having the option to to discover one or two uh two clues depending on how many charges you spend is uh, is pretty nice so so far uh I think the uh, the evade version of the triad is very very good, and I think this uh, the investigate version here in divination is pretty good as well. So I'm liking the looks of uh, this triad so far. So we'll see what happens when the uh, the box is released. We'll see what the combat uh, or the fight one does. See if it uh, if it keeps up the winning streak here. I think that brings us to our final card of oh, that was spoiled. Man, there are a ton of cards that were spoiled in the preview this is michael lay experienced hunter four cost ally that costs five experience points he's a guardian and a seeker card intellect combat and wild skill icons ally and detective traits uh, while he is on the table you get plus one intellect and plus one combat as a response after you successfully investigate place one resource from the token pool on michael lay as evidence to a maximum of three evidence and then as a response, when you initiate an attack, exhaust Michael Lay and spend one evidence, you get plus one damage for this attack. He has three health and three sanity, and he takes up an ally slot. Now, this guy is, uh, man, oh man, there's a lot. Five experience points is a significant commitment if you're purchasing a car that costs five experience points. So you expect to get something powerful in return, and... I think uh, Michael is, I think he's good enough. He he gives you plus one intellect, which is going to help you discover clues, which you need to do in order to uh, to stack that evidence on him. So this is really geared towards, uh, I think somebody like Joe Diamond, who can, who can both fight and investigate. Uh, somebody like Joe can get this guy down. Uh, he can investigate at locations to, pack this guy full of uh, evidence tokens and then when it when time comes to fight uh, Michael helps him in that regard by by uh, boosting up his damage now the ability to deal additional damage outside of cards like vicious blow or um, uh, fight actions on events is still pretty rare there aren't a lot of cards that help you boost damage so the ability here of Michael to uh, to give you plus one damage for essentially doing something that you were already going to do you were already going to investigate locations to gather clues and this guy just gives you a little bit of a a perk on top of that to uh to deal additional damage now three health and three sanity that's a fair amount of soak uh, you can soak uh, quite a bit of damage and horror with this guy especially if you uh, throw in some healing for an ally so that's pretty good the only downside I can sort of see with Michael here is 
A, I mean, five experience points, that's not going to fit in an awful lot of decks. You really have to commit uh, if you want to uh, to purchase Michael. The other downside is that uh, that second response, uh, you have to trigger it when you initiate the attack. And you have to exhaust Michael to do it and spend the evidence. So you don't know whether the attack is successful or not. So there are going to be times when you... Um, fire up a fight action against an enemy, you trigger Michael's response, exhaust him, spend the evidence, and then you draw a to uh, an auto fail token or the attack fails and you get nothing out of it and you've lost the evidence. You don't, uh, you've don't. you got to trigger that, uh, trigger that response before you know whether the attack is successful or not. So there are going to be times when uh, Michael fails to uh, to come through for you. Not too sure, honestly. Uh, I can't really think of an investigator offhand besides sort of somebody like Joe Diamond who uh, who would be interested in a card like this just because he does, he, he does have the option of investigating and fighting. Initially, I thought of somebody like Roland, but Roland tends to want to wanna get clues by not successfully investigating but by using triggering his response so i'm not too sure i don't think he'd be all that interested in michael um trying to think offhand whether there's anybody else i mean plus one intellect and plus one combat is is very attractive but i don't know we'll see i'm i'm sure there are uh there are many deck builders in the community who are better than me who are uh, who can think of uh, options for this guy Again, five experience points is pretty pricey, but I think you can, uh, I mean, if you're able to trigger that plus one damage consistently, uh, I think he is, uh, he's probably, uh, he's probably worth it. Oh, I've been talking for like three hours straight, I think at this point. That is gonna do it for my Edge of the Earth player card preview. Oh man, there are, I mean, judging by the preview, there are 250 player cards. I'm sure that includes duplicates uh, coming in the Edge of the Earth Investigator expansion. That is like an entire cycle's worth of cards in one box, all for, uh, I think it ends up being about 40 bucks. So, uh, man, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do when this is released because that's a lot of cards to review. Uh, I'd probably have to change up. Nate and I are going to have to change up our review uh or how we review cards uh, with that many cards dumped in at, at once. But uh, once this box hits, uh, I think deck builders are going to have months and months of joy ahead of them. Uh, I like the look of a lot of the cards uh, that were in the preview article. Some obviously are more interesting than others, and uh, it's tough to say. I mean, with so many cards being released at once, there are obviously combos that... Uh, that we will not uh, know about yet so uh, we will just have to wait and see as more cards are spoiled or leaked and or uh, uh, released we shall see uh, how this uh, expansion shapes up but so far some really good cards in this box i've hoped that you have enjoyed uh, my edge of the earth uh, preview stay tuned for more great arkham horror content i've got a few uh, videos in the pipeline and uh, Game of the Day will be making a return here shortly. And of course, uh, we've always got uh, deck techs and whatnot. Hope you'll stay tuned for that. Uh, until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. That's going to do it for this episode. If you enjoyed what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you need to contact me, I can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at manfromlang. Until the stars are right, keep your shotgun close and your elder sign closer. Take care out there, and happy investigating.